afternoon everyone uh, my name is sunil so today me and tusar will be presenting the paper on un uh, unmasking clever ants predictors and assessing what machines really learn these are the authors that have contributed uh, in this paper so here we are going to talk about what is explainable ai and uh, why it is needed we will see some of the previous method that are being used for explainable ai then we'll be introducing uh, the lrp method that is layer wise relevance propagation we'll be also seeing what is spray uh, that is spray relevance analysis which is basically applying the lrp on the whole data set then we'll see one of the used case uh, in the comparison area uh, where uh, uh, we are applying spray on fisher vector and dnn uh, which are trained on pascal voc uh, 2007 and at last we'll be going through some of the conclusion and thought that we have drawn out of this paper and also we'll be adding some viewpoints uh, um, uh, for uh, for and against uh, of this paper so uh, what is explainable ai and uh, our non linear systems are truly black box so as we all know that uh, machine learning systems are giving you best result in the industry all over the industry and uh, they are as well uh, matching human level accuracy also but there are some security critical areas like loan approval medical diagnosis or the autonomous vehicle where people need to know uh, how this decision is being made and why this decision is being made so if you see here the model uh, this figure so this model is about the loan approval model where we have several different factors uh, or the features you can say like age sex bp bmi based on which the prediction is being made so uh, here people wants to know uh, on which factor the uh, decision is being made because let's say if some people uh, uh, loan approval got rejected so before applying for the next loan they need to know based on which uh, factor it got rejected so that next time at least for that factor it should not reject uh, it should not reject right so that is the thing so uh, so so for that uh, many uh, studies has been done and then uh, it has been found that many models learn in a clever hands fashion so what is this clever hands basically so um, uh, clever hands is basically a phenomenon um, and in 1970 70 a, a man named von austen who has a horse and it was believed that that horse was able to uh, solve the arithmetic sum so let's say when uh, when this people used to give him uh, uh, give him the arithmetic sum uh, for 2 plus 3 the horse used to tap its leg five times and uh, after which the people used to clap and this how it is believed that the horse was able to solve the arithmetic sum so uh, but when horse was subjected to a psychological evaluation and uh, the psychology didn't uh, uh, was not interested in clapping uh, like the other people the horse was not uh, uh, stopping its tapping so it was continuously tapping its leg it was not stopping so uh, which uh, which fails uh, means uh, so we can conclude that the horse was not uh, actually solving the arithmetic sum it was focusing on the people clap and uh, based on which uh, he was uh, he was predicting when to stop its tapping okay so this is uh, in in this way in this clever way the horse used to uh, 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 do the uh, do the arithmetic sum so uh, similarly in this dnn uh, uh, the clever hands uh, they use this technique uh, to make the uh, prediction uh, so basically uh, if you see the aeroplane scenario over here uh, um, in the in the majority of the data set uh, uh, the images that we have in the data set uh, where the object is aeroplane most of the images has sky in its background so uh, so when these images are being trained uh, this background is being 
being exploited and um, the dnn uh, used to uh, uh, train it and used to predict those uh, models uh, used to predict those images as aeroplane but what what if the co occurrence uh, factor like this background the sky background is not in these images when the uh, when the aeroplane is at, uh, is at the ground like here uh, only half of the image has sky in its uh, background uh, here only one foot of the image uh, is having sky in its background so at that time dnn might or might not able to predict properly because uh, if you see here in the image you can see uh, the part in which the sky is in background that part uh, of, uh, of the picture uh, shows the uh, is able to predict the part of the plane but the other half which is at the ground it is not able to predict so uh, it has many uh, difficulties uh, in this black box means how it works so to deal with this black box na nature many popular heat map techniques came uh, so the most popular heat map techniques uh, are cam and grad cams um, so this is the first the first one is the cam um, the second one is the grad cam so these are uh, these are very popular and extensively applied everywhere but uh, they didn't contributed much to the explainable ai as these are applied at the later stage only and not applied in, in the pixel level so here sensitive analysis came into the picture as uh, it works at the pixel level so basically uh, statistical analysis what it says it uh, 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 basically uh, sensitive analysis what it says uh, it uh, it is the partial derivative over all the pixel of the prediction um, that is found or calculated and the norm is kept but while calculating this norm the direction has been lost so again this is not the right criteria to find out why the decision is being made so to overcome this type of problem um the lrp concept came so uh, uh, lrp is known as layer wise relevance propagation so basically this is the method to identify all the important pixels that contribute more uh, to the decision or the output f of x and this is achieved by decomposition of prediction in terms of its input that forms the decision so if you see here in the figure we have x1 x2 x3 up to xd as the input and when this is applied on the black box uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, and it is trained in a forward or pass manner we will get the output as f of x1 x2 up to xd and once we get the output the lrp is used to decompose the prediction into the relevance component r1 r2 up to rd and this summation uh, will be conserved over the entire network so since uh, since it uh, since it's been said that the layer wise relevance propagation calculate the relevance at the pixel level each pixel is assigned a score that signifies the contribution in terms of decision making so if you see here in the figure uh, uh, you can see here a very nice uh, heat map over here which is calculated by the lrp so the red part and the blue part uh, is mainly the focus area uh, because it ha it has the pixel uh, with um, uh, uh, it has a pixel uh, point which has higher uh, here in this area basically and uh, the uh, uh, and it has the more relevance also so we can say uh, that the model, model is focusing basically on this area based on which the prediction is being made and it can also be shown that the relevance at each activation xj is directly proportional to the xj itself multiplied with the wjk that is the weight connecting to the respective node uh, multiplied with the relevance uh, uh, at the kth layer that is rk so let let's see some of, uh, let's see some of the characteristics of the lrp the first one is the relevance uh, of conservation property which we have already seen the second one is the decomposable at any neuron the third one is the as lrp calculate the relevance at the pixel level so each pixel is given a score that signifies the contribution uh, it is making towards the decision the fourth one is that uh, it works in a similar fashion as the back propagation but yes lrp doesn't interfere with the model back propagation because lrp is applied on the train model 
while the model propag uh, while the model back propagation is done while the uh, while the training in between the training and the back propagation is done and and lrp works we, uh, in calculating the relevance while uh, the model back propagation calculates the error um, in it so both are completely independent of each other so once the lrp is calculated is computed uh, we produce the heat map that has the same size as the input images so if you see here in the figure, uh, uh, we have an image in which uh, we have a, uh, we have an object that is head of the cat. And when this is passed through the network, neural network in a forward pass manner, we will get the output or some prediction. And once we get the output or uh, the prediction, the LR is used to uh, compute from output to input and all the relevance till the pixel level um, is being calculated in a backward pass manner. And finally, we'll get the heat map, which contains all the important features uh, like the head of a cat, uh, um, uh, which can be used for the classification. And, and one more thing we need to note here that the background of the image is not being considered in the heat map which is a good thing. And also uh, the distracting uh, structures like the horizontal line, which is there on the top of the uh, head of the uh, cat is also is not being considered in the heat map. So, which is good. So now the question comes, key, how we need to calculate this RJ on the last layer. So to do that, we need to do a, uh, we, we need, uh, we, we use Teller series expansion uh, for decomposition. So as we all know um, that Teller series at point A is equal to, uh, is F of X is equal to F of A plus F dash of A by one factorial into X minus A plus F double dash A by two factorial into X minus A square. Um, and this way uh, in, uh, and this, the similar patterns continues. But here, as we are considering only the first order derivative, so from this to the last, uh, we can uh, we can uh, replace it with epsilon. And now, to calculate the f of x, we need to get the root point a. So, how to get this root point a? So, um, it can be uh, a good root point is the one uh, if we remove the object from the given image so that the prediction will be negative. So, let's say if a is equal to x negative such that f of x uh, negative is equal to zero. So, uh, uh, by putting this thing in the of, uh, in the above equation, we can simplify it and uh, f of x is equal to f of x negative plus f dash of x negative by one factorial into x minus x negative plus epsilon. Uh, and on the further simplification, we will get f dash of x negative into x minus x negative, which is nothing but the rj on the last layer. Hey, Sunil, so it's not called negative, it's called tilde. X tilde. Uh, yeah, sorry, it's tilde. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So how to how to get this x tilde? Uh, basically, uh, we can get this x tilde by by blurring the object uh, in the image so that the prediction will be negative. So in the picture wise, if you see uh, this thing, uh, let's say we have an input image in which uh, we have a building as the object. Um, to get the root point, we are blurring this uh, building uh, and so that the prediction will be negative. So that is uh, x tilde. And after uh, getting the root point, we can compute gradient and the difference on top of it. And once that is done, we'll be doing a element wise multiplication uh, and from which we can get the uh, desired heat map, uh, which is nothing but the RJ on the last layer. So once this RJ is being calculated, we, we need, uh, once this RJ is being calculated, we need to back propagate to the previous layer till we reaches the pixel level. And this is done uh, using the LRP technique. So before that, let's go through the uh, normal uh, uh, forward pass that we usually do in the neural network. Let's say we have a WIJ uh, uh, as a weight vector between the two neuron and uh, uh, XI, uh, uh, XI is the neuron in the layer L, XJ is the neuron in the layer L plus one. Um, so uh, we can calculate uh, ZIJ is equal to WIJ into XI. So here XI is not the, uh, it's not the normal neuron, uh, it's the activation neuron. 
So once this uh, ZIJ is being calculated, then we can calculate this ZJ as the uh, summation of all this neuron um, in the layer in the i-th layer, um, uh, we can calculate this jij plus bias. And once this is being calculated, uh, um, we can apply the nonlinear function on top of uh, jj so that to calculate this xj. So uh, uh, once we calculate this xj by conservation law, we can say that uh, rj at the l plus one uh, layer can be decomposed into the previous layer in this way, and um, we, uh, which is nothing but the uh, summation of all the relevance uh, uh, that we have calculated uh, following from J to I, uh, from L plus one layer to layer L. So uh, after that, we can calculate this Ri in this way. Uh, I um, this is nothing but uh, I just replace this Zij with this component and Zj with this one and we got this ri with respect to rj so now to calculate this zij uh, there are different lrp rules uh, uh, which are used based on the different cases so what are the different lrp rules uh, so the first one is the lrp0 so this is the basic one and uh, um, that we have already discussed so in the previous one uh, we have used xi term so here only uh, uh, they have used the AJ term, rest everything is same. So this is the basic one. The next one is the LRP uh, epsilon, uh, where uh, epsilon is being added to the denominator and it helps uh, in absorbing some of the relevance uh, when the contribution to the uh, activation of the neuron K are weak or contradictory. So as epsilon becomes larger, only the most important relevance survives. The next one is the LRP gamma. So this is a rule where we are favoring the effect of positive contribution over the negative contribution. So the parameter uh, gamma decides uh, or controls uh, how much positive contribution are being favored. So as gamma increases, the negative contribution starts to disappear. The next one is the LRP alpha beta. So this is an interesting one because from here only the positive and negative uh, contribution uh, concept came originally. And this is calculated with this alpha beta thing. And when, uh, when, you, when you put alpha equal to one and beta equal to zero, this LR, LRP alpha beta can be uh, simplified into uh, this LRP gamma. Okay, so as we can see here, each of these rules are applied on different layer and, uh, um, and, all, and so it has the different significance. And uh, this way, all the LRP rules are being used uh, for explaining the different uh, neural network architecture. So now here uh, we'll be comparing the heat map that are generated from LRP and the sensitive analysis. So in the first figure, we can see the cat image. Uh, again, the same image that we are seeing in the previous slides. So here we can see in the sensitive heat map, it, um, the heat map is only focusing on the few pixels so on the object. But if you see the deep Taylor uh, thing for both CafeNet and Google Net, uh, we can see the heat map are uh, focusing on the whole object, basically. And complete head of the uh, cat can be detected from it. And one, one more thing we can note here that the uh, heat map of Google Net has a better quality than the heat map of the CafeNet. In the next image, uh, similarly, the dorsal fin of the shark is represented well in the deep tailor as compared to the sensitive one. In the, in the next image, we can see that the heat map are able to detect the two instances, the two instances of the uh, same object in the same image. So you can see here. So the same instance can be detected easily. And uh, uh, now, uh, in the next image, we can see uh, where the LRP doesn't work well here because as here in this image, um, the objects are being overlapped on top of each other. So uh, this where the LRP doesn't work well and uh, um, uh, some of the relevance uh, 
factor are also being lost. But yes, um, uh, in all this heat map, you can see a, um, a background are not being considered, and also the distracting, um, uh, uh, also the distracting structure are also being ignored in the heat map. So the next thing will be here, we, we are going to talk about uh, where and how we'll be using the LRP. Uh, let's say we have three images of Iris class, Iris uh, Setosa, uh, which is being represented by red dot, Iris Virginica, which is being represented by green dot, and Iris Versic color, which is being represented by blue, uh, 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 blue dot. And we need to classify those. Let's say we use linear classification first. Uh, so here it is very easy to classify these flowers uh, because we uh, to classify these uh, flowers, we are using only the common features across um, that is the sepal width and based on which the classification is done. But on nonlinear classification, it is not that simple. As you can see here, so you know, we use different kind of feature set to do the actual classification. So it becomes more difficult to extract the knowledge from the nonlinear classification. And therefore we need LRP method where we can get pixel wise score for each of the pixel. So in the contribution towards the decision making. So for the first image, if you see here, LRP is applied on the board and it looks like the board body itself. It's completely looking on the board body itself. And based on that, it's uh, creating the heat map. In the second one, if you see here, uh, the LRP is looking at the sail of the board and accordingly it's creating the heat map. So in the third one, uh, similarly, it's completely focusing on the boat of the body. So to classify the entire uh, boat class, we need to aggregate all this heat map and so that it is looking um, at the middle uh, part based on which the uh, prediction will be made. So now uh, what we have seen till now is that LRP gives relevance for the single images. But again, what about the whole data set? Uh, so this can be done using spray. Um, um, and from here, Tusar uh, will be uh, taking on the slide. Thanks. Uh, so we saw the LRP in action for a single image and how it can give us the relevant uh, pixels which contribute to the prediction. But uh, we are dealing with uh, huge data sets and one way we can deal with them is just apply LRP on each of these images and uh, manually analyze each of those but that's just cumbersome. So that's where the innovation of this paper comes into the picture, which is a spectral relevance analysis, uh, which is nothing but, uh, it, it looks like a big name though, but it's nothing but just applying a spectral clustering on the LRPs obtained uh, by the data sets. That means you just uh, apply the LRP uh, for each of the image in the data set and then apply a spectral clustering method on that. So let's see what uh, this spectral clustering method is uh, in the next slides, but uh, let's just go over the flow first. So first thing, first step is to apply the LRP on the full test or the evaluation set, okay? Next thing, we can reduce the dimensions. This is like a optional step, uh, but if we reduce the dimensions, it can accelerate our process and it can reduce the dimensionality. Uh, next thing is we apply spectral clustering on relevance maps. Uh, spectral clustering, spectral clustering is looks like a big name, but uh, it's a, a common data analysis visualization technique. Uh, that's that's like that's it's around there. Uh, it's been around there. They have just applied it in their paper. Uh, next thing is to uh, uh, find eigen gaps uh, using the spectral and uh, spectral clustering. Uh, I'll tell you how this eigen thing will come into the picture. Uh, next thing is we, uh, this is an optional step where we use a TSNE visualization uh, on the LRPs uh, obtained from the data set uh, to view the different clusters and report problematic clusters to the user. Uh, that uh, since we are like keeping a human in a loop here, uh, this is, uh, just a second, uh, yeah. Uh, this is called a, a semi-automatic method. Right. So let's uh, go over what the actual spectral clustering is. So, uh, so first in the spectral clustering, we compute the weight adjacency matrix W. Uh, what what is that? Let's see. Uh, so 
So for n samples, uh, let's say we have n samples, uh, we compute W i j for uh, i j being each uh, ranging from one to n. That means it's a square matrix. And uh, for each component S i and S j, uh, we are considering the LRPs in our case. Uh, it can be anything that the spectral clustering method is applied on, but in our case, it will be the LRP. So, uh, so, so how do you how do we compute a wij a single element wij? Uh, it's simple. If if the si and sjs are k nearest neighbor of each other, then it's uh, it's setting one or zero. So they try to apply uh, a different type of uh, a grouping mechanism like. Uh, the Euclidean distance between SI and SJ. And uh, they say that it's like using this binary K nearest uh, thing and using that is almost similar, right? Then uh, we calculate uh, to, to, to make it uh, more symmetric. What they do is uh, if, if the K nearest neighbor is not detected with SI and SJ, but it's detected with SJ and SI, then they just find the maximum between those. Uh, and then we find a diagonal, uh, a, a diagonal matrix, which is called a degree of connectivity. And it is found such that for each uh, diagonal element di, it is the summation of the entire row, that is the wij uh, over the j. Uh, and now we uh, subtract the d minus, uh, so we subtract the weight, uh, the w matrix from the d matrix to find the Laplacian uh, of this. Uh, and and this is uh, applied. Uh, this is passed through a SVD computation, which will give you eigenvectors and eigenvalues. That's how the eigenvectors and values come into the play. Uh, now this method is 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 the standard way of how the spectral clustering operates, and not is is not the innovation by the authors. So you don't have to like uh, be uh, intimate, intimidated by all this information. Uh, so. And after we have the SVDs and eigenvectors, we apply K KNN on eigenvectors to actually obtain the cluster labels uh, for those eigen clusters, right? So let's see, we, uh, we have a synthetic distribution which resembles the uh, actual distribution of the data and uh, the spread of the data is like 0.2. So therefore we can see the, uh, there are four distinct clusters in this and uh, and and four are like completely disjoint nothing of them uh, overlaps with each other uh, when when we find out the eigen values and decompose them uh, we find that the four of the eigen values are close to zero which resembles the four disjoint clusters but we can also see some of the eigen values there uh, which are not zero and what do they signify so uh, what they say is after applying the spectral clustering, uh, the uh, the clusters are not exactly disjoint, and some of them will be like uh, interconnected with each other or uh, like uh, in going into the uh, each other. But four, uh, but some of them will be disjoint, and that that the number of disjoint clusters that can be found uh, is actually the values which are uh, which are exactly zero or like close to zero in the eigenvalue spectrum. Let's see another distribution with the spread of like 0.4. And here we can see that um, the, the clusters are a little bit spread out. And thus one of the cluster value is not exact. Uh, this one of the eigenvalue is not exactly zero, but it's mm -hmm. close to zero. Uh, next, we have a more like a uh, spread out distribution with uh, sigma is equal to 0 0.8. And now we can see that even we can't tell which is uh, which are like dis disjoint clusters, but roughly we can tell two are like disjoint clusters. Therefore, we like this one uh, from a zero to four and from like from five to eight uh, and onwards. Uh, these are like two disjoint, disjoint clusters we can find visually and therefore two eigenvalues are exactly zero while one is like close to zero. And from there it's like increasing. Uh, whereas uh, the gaps uh, in the eigenvalue increase uh, in the eigenvalue trends can actually tell us the uh, problematic clusters uh, which have the clever hands uh, phenomenon. Uh, we'll we'll, uh, we'll uh, test our hypothesis that in the next uh, slides. Uh, but what do we learn by the eigenvalue thing? The first thing is that 
the large gaps corresponds to the anomalies and second thing is that the number of zeros or uh, or near zero values are the number of these joint clusters in the eigen uh, found by the eigen uh, value decomposition right so let's uh, just summarize the spectral analysis flow so the first step is to apply just a second my um, why is it acting like that i'm not Okay. So first we apply, uh, first we find a, a evaluation test set and then we pass it through the, our trained classifier. Uh, and now uh, based on the predictions, uh, we apply the LRP and obtain the heat maps for each of these images. Next, uh, what we do is we apply spectral clustering on these LRPs and uh, find a, this is again acting weird. Uh, can, can I just uh, reshare the screen? It's weird. Yeah, yeah. Who, who's controlling the? the I, I'm controlling. No one's controlling, but I'm still not yeah, getting. Yeah, it's right. fine if you want to get out and reshare. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah, just give me a second. Yeah, exit and then come back. Yeah. yeah okay. So once we have the. Uh, LRPs, we apply the SVD, uh, sorry, the spectral clustering and uh, spectral clustering will give us that matrix, weight connected matrix, and then that will be uh, whose Laplacian will be decomposed to find uh, find the eigenvalues. And based on these eigenvalues, we have this cluster. So what does this cluster exactly mean? These clusters are like the clusters of LRPs, right? That means the uh, images in one cluster are uh, have the similar LRPs, which means they have similar sort of explainability or similar uh, predictability for the model, right? Uh, and next thing is we, uh, which is a optional thing, which is to apply TSNE to give a, it's again acting here, but that's fine. Uh, yeah, we apply a TSNE to- I think you have put timing or something. Have you put timing? So if you no, actually without not. timing, then it won't change. Can say, I haven't put timing. I'm just starting timing. This it's, there. it's there. It's there. Just, just use timing. Just unclick that one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now do the slide. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so. Good. Yeah. Thank you. The laser phone. Yeah, so uh, if the TSNE visualizations are based on the LRPs. Uh, we uh, and then if we view some of these uh, clusters, uh, we can see different strategies for decision making. For example, for detecting horse, they have found like four different uh, strategies to detect it as a horse. Uh, and for first cluster, we can say that uh, it's focusing on the horse itself, horse body for detecting it as a horse. In the second cluster, it's looking at the horse and the bottom left corner of the image. Uh, I'll, I'll, let, I'll uh, expand on that, why it's looking at the uh, bottom left corner also. And then in the third cluster, it's looking at the horse and the horse rider. Uh, whereas in the third cluster, it's, uh, it's solely looking at the bottom left corner of the uh, image, right? So let's let's see what the Fisher vector is first, and we'll come to that why we want to see look at the Fisher vector. It's like a old it's the old computer vision model, uh, classic computer vision model, but it works in a nonlinear fashion. Uh, so first step is to you apply shift and find the feature descriptors in a scale pyramid fashion. Scale pyramid fashion means that we apply this uh, feature descriptors at different scales of the images and combine all of those. Uh, then we reduce those using the principal component analysis and uh, find the and model them using the Gaussian mixed models. Uh, that gives us a Fisher vector representation, which is then applied to a SVM for uh, for the for the prediction, final prediction of the classification. Now, uh, uh, so so we want to see uh, the Fisher vectors, uh, Claver-Hans phenomenon versus the DNNs 
uh, phenomenon, right? The, the, the strategies both of these models use to make the prediction and it can be found using the spray. So as I told you why it was uh, in the previous uh, cluster, we saw that in previous slides, we saw that uh, some of the images were looking at the bottom left corner of the image. And it was found that in Pascal VOC data set, some of the horse images contained a, a source tag uh, for the for particularly the horse images. And uh, this information was being exploited by the Fisher vector models to detect this as a horse. What if we remove this uh, source uh, tag, then the prediction is not horse anymore. What if we take this? Uh, what if we take this uh, source tag and add it to a different image? Let's say car. Then a car is uh, predicted as a horse, right? Um, so this is clearly a clever hands phenomenon, wherein the uh, some spurious uh, data is being used for uh, these. Uh, uh, for this prediction, this this won't happen in the real world data set, and therefore uh, this this is not the right way to do the decision. Uh, so let's see what we we have discussed this eigenvalue and eigens uh, eigen vectors thing. Let's see if th those concept can help us detect these problems. So uh, let's try to explain this phenomena of using the eigenvalues. Right for normal images, that is the ground truth images. Uh, the eigenvalue should increase like this. And ideally, our predictor network should match this trend of the eigenvalues. Uh, so DNN matches a little bit, uh, but Fisher vector has a large gap in this. It turns out that the gap uh, corresponding to this cluster, uh, that the cluster which, which corresponds to the gap rather, uh, is the horse uh, cluster, uh, right? Which, which detects based on the source tag. So, uh, let's see if this uh, this this in a more uh, clear way or to let's say it for the entire horse data set right so since we are looking at horse also let's look at the boat boat also right uh, these are the two models and uh, a feature vector and dnn and uh, over all the classes these are their mean accuracies uh, or the class accuracies uh, for almost all the class they are sim similar uh, with with little difference but uh, mostly they are similar but we want to take a look at two main classes boat and horse and and both of these have similar class accuracies for both of these models right um, but let's see uh, whether they are qualitatively similar so here we have a image of a boat and uh, we can see clearly the Fisher vector is looking at the sea background for, to detect it as a boat. In the second one, uh, the boat is now placed in a desert island and now it cannot find a sea, but it's still looking at some of the portion in the sky, which, which resembles like a, uh, which, which resembles to the sky blue background of the, of the uh, or the blue background of the ocean. Uh, the average heat map, if we calculate, is is actually looking at the ocean rather than the boat itself. So clearly, Fisher vectors uh, base their decisions on that. But it meaning that if if the if this background information is removed, then Fisher vector will fail. Uh, but in case of DNN, uh, it is learning uh, better than the Fisher vector since it is focusing uh, its decision on the body of the boat, as we can see in the images. While the uh, average heat map is the entire body of the boat. For horse. Uh, Fisher vector is mainly looking at the uh, source tag, which is present in the lower left corner of the image and some part of the tail of the horse. Uh, the average heat map is everywhere else other than the horse itself and uh, the source tag. Uh, for DNN, uh, for for DNN, the main por uh, the main focus is on the horse and the horse rider. Uh, the average heat map. Uh, uh, clearly signifies that uh, in f uh, in the fisher vector i should mention that uh, this is not a um, a bad uh, prediction for fisher vector because fisher vector's prediction is based on the context of the images but then again when 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 contexts are used uh, such source stack context can be used to uh, to actually make them into the clever hands way because source stack is not going to be present there always maybe a boat will be always present with the sea but uh, not the source stack right so so that's a clear a, clearly a problem uh, with with uh, training with Fisher vectors. Uh, with this eigenvalue analysis, we also uh, got to know that there is a 
fault in airplane detection also in like both the models in DNN and the Fisher vector. So let's see what, what is that fault. So uh, when we have a Fisher vector, these are the Fisher vector heat maps and uh, from the heat maps, it's clearly seen that uh, the decision is based on the background of the aeroplane and not the body of the air, airplane or aeroplane. And then uh, in, in DNN heat maps, uh, we can see that uh, the decision is based on, uh, what, what is this? This is a stripes from the up, upper corner, the left right corner, the bottom corner, the left corner. These are actually the paddings we add to the DNN as a pre-processing step to make them into the similar size. Right. Unfortunately, uh, uh, the DNN models learn to exploit these paddings as a uh, as a prediction category for the uh, airplanes. So let's see. Uh, let's let's test this hypothesis. Let's see. Try to remove these uh, uh, paddings and see if whether uh, the same decision will be made or not. Uh, so for this experiment, they try to hamper the dependency on the padding. So this is the first image, and uh, this is this is the source image, or you can uh, say it as a baseline image, uh, where the borders or the paddings uh, are copied uh, copied across the borders, right? Uh, and we can see the classification accuracy is uh, 1.8 uh, for it, uh, but and and the heat map clearly shows that it's looking at the uh, borders padding along with the body of the uh, aeroplane. For, uh, for for giving you this classification score. This is another image of the airplane and it, it too has the 1.92 as its classification score. But this image uh, is looking mainly at the body of the airplane, but we can also see some of the light uh, red areas in this image. This is not clearly visible, but uh, yeah, there, there is some uh, reddishness uh, in the bottom strip there. Uh, so, it, so we can say that it's, it's still focusing on the bottom of the stripes, right? Uh, in the second image, we we are mirroring uh, that uh, mirroring the borders, right? It's not mirroring the image; it's mirroring the borders of the or the paddings of the images. So, let's say for upper, maybe it's mirroring the bottom uh, corner. For the for the left, it's mirroring the right corner, and vice versa. And we can see the uh, we can see the increase in the accuracy. Uh, this is because they argue that. Uh, this is this is increasing the skyness of the or, or we are enriching the skyness uh, of the image and therefore the uh, airplane prediction is increased. Uh, we can see again the heat maps show clearly that it's looking at the stripes. Uh, for the second image, the mirroring uh, decreases the uh, uh, accuracy or the confidence, but uh, and still it's it's still close to one. Uh, and we can see clearly now in this picture that it's looking at the bottom stripes. For another uh, uh, for another type of uh, padding strategy where we crop the paddings, now the classification accuracy or confidence is decreased to 0.76. And uh, we can see it's tr still trying to focus on the top and the bottom strips, but this this time it it doesn't have those uh, strips there. Uh, or or the structure is reduced uh, of that sky and therefore the prediction accuracy is is decreased for the second image uh, in fact in here we can see that the body of the image uh, body of the airplane is also cropped and no wonder the decision has uh, decreased uh, so drastically still it's trying to focus on the bottom part bottom strip uh, hey, Tushar, the you, you can maybe skip that i think people got an idea about this you can move on and go to the next one. Huh? Yeah, when when we add like the sky blue, then uh, actually this is the like end of the presentation. It's after okay, that, it's just going. conclusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so this this is the sky blue. When we add a sky blue color, it's uh, like adding into the sky itself, so it increases the prediction. For the second one, although uh, even though the sky blue background was not present, when we add sky blue, it increased its prediction uh, with respect to its baseline. That is because uh, of this relation it has learned, uh, right? Because it, it has learned to expect a sky blue type of background and the stripes, right? Uh, 
when we add random color uh, the the re- it, it it's reduced the the classification accuracy is reduced as compared to the baseline uh, but still there is a uniformity in the random color and therefore it it's still having the higher confidence in here uh, the random color is not sky blue therefore it's like decreased in in this case uh, while when we add a random noise it's it's like a high frequency data and uh, it, it has rather learned to expect uh, a dull and uniform data uh, but we are uh, now giving a, a, a random data therefore the classification uh, classification accuracy is uh, drastically reduced in both the images so this can uh, tell us that the dnns were also learning from the paddings right uh, so th- that this was the like end of the paper because other part was focusing on the reinforcement learning and we are not explaining into that so uh, these are the uh, so so conclusions are is, is straightforward that the nonlinear models can be explained until the pixel level we have a systematic relevance measuring uh, method and uh, explainable ai can serve as ai regulator what i mean by that is that uh, that there are many startups and many methods coming into the picture but uh, we can check whether their models are learning properly uh, or not U- using that uh, this uh, this ai methods can be like regulated uh, the spray can be uh, can help us find clever hands in the big data sets without actually going over the cumbersome manual efforts uh the four for the paper is that we have the pixel level explanation of course systematic measurement uh multiple ways we have uh, uh, in which we can implement uh while the clever hands detection in the big data set uh for like uh the against what i have is uh this method actually uh, is dependent on the uh, the lrp has to be modified for each method that we are applying to for dnn there is a different formula for fisher vector there is a different formula and so on but uh, the main thing i think is that uh, it, this is in a bro- broader context not in the uh, like technical context of the paper but uh, this d- doesn't explain fully why as in we know some of the p- pixels are playing part into the decision but how they are playing part it's still not known uh, we haven't gleaned the function mappings which it's learning in 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 its black box and why do we need that because some of the tasks uh, even in, in there we even the human knowledge is like limited where we have the ill uh, ill post problems like depth estimation or multi view synthesis in those cases uh, lean learning the this function mappings can help uh, uh, you know further uh, the human knowledge as well third the last point i think is that it depends on the human instincts of verification uh, as in uh, we know uh, we could detect the horse uh, thing by our own uh, instincts because we know how to detect the horse visually but uh, how about the depth estimation we don't know how to detect the depth uh, visually i mean we can but it's an approximate uh, manner in a approximate manner or in a multi view synthesis in a approximate manner mm-hmm. so in in domains where even human instincts is limited uh, how about then how 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 will this work in that uh, domain and that's how we like end this presentation thank you